restored. So I will rise and lift my head, for by His mercy my life was spared. The highest name has set me free, because of Jesus my heart Jesus, my heart is clean. Mountains are still being moved. Strongholds are still being moved. God, we believe it. Yes, we can see that wonders are still what you do.
Look around. It doesn't take long to recognize the brokenness surrounding us. Division, hatred, fear, uncertainty. The pain we're witnessing is real, and the need for a savior is undeniable. It's this need which broke the heart of God and moved him to do the unimaginable. For God so loved the world, he sent his only son to change our eternity, to be the perfect sacrifice for us. Love on a cross, dying once for all, laid to rest in the darkness of a tomb. Today, as we face so many unknowns, may we remember the simple truth of Easter. The stone's been rolled away. The grave is empty. Jesus is alive. And love has risen. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great. Let's stand together. Let's sing about our love for Jesus. And see what our Savior has done. And see how His love overcomes. And He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God. And you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm. Every storm. And you'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. I know you will do it again For your promise is yes and amen You will do great things God, you do great things Sing it out, come on Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the rain You free every captive and break every chain Oh, God, you have the great your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have the grace. So we sing hallelujah. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have the great things. God of all grace, who has 
spot us and sought us and guided our ways. Hallelujah, and the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, and the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Revive us again. Let me try to do that love. May so be rekindled with fire. J.C. Thomas, and I'm the Multicultural Involvement Minister here at the Pleasant Valley Church of Christ. We want to welcome all of you who have come to worship with us this morning, whether you are online or whether you are present with us in this assembly. Here at the Pleasant Valley Church, we have a threefold mission. First, our aim is to follow Jesus wherever he leads us. Secondly, we want to build bridges across whatever divides there are, to include ethnic, cultural, generational, just to name a few. And then finally, we are interested in making sure that we make disciples. We, if you are contemplating becoming a disciple of Jesus, we would love to show you how to do that as you are baptized. And then we'd like to also uh, encourage those of you who are here, uh, those of you who, who um, would like to, we would like to, to let you know that we want to know that you're here today. And we'd like for you to register with us by simply texting the number there. If you will do that, for all of those who will, we will give $5 donation to Arkansas Immersh. Arkansas Immersh is a local uh, charity that is donated to helping those youth who have aged out of the uh, foster care. And so again, we want to welcome you. We're delighted that you're here. And now let's engage in worship continually as we worship our Lord. Let's stand together. Well, let us worship the Father, worship the Father, worship the Father of glory. Well, let us worship the Father, worship the Father, worship the Father of love. Oh 
in the quiet unfolding of Easter morning. May you find the courage to embrace the unknown, to navigate the thresholds of your own soul, and to discover the sacred within the ordinary. May the resurrection light illuminate your path, guiding you through the shadows of doubt. And may the echoes of grace be heard in the sacred conversations with your own heart. As you stand on the threshold of possibility, may you be enfolded in the tender embrace of hope. And may the blessings of Easter awaken in you a deep sense of gratitude for the gift of life. May you dance with the rhythm of resurrection, feeling the heartbeat of the universe in the beauty of nature and the poetry of existence. And may your soul sing the song of rebirth. May you live as a pilgrim of the heart, honoring the sacredness of every step. And may the blessings of Easter be with you always. Amen. Father, we're reminded of this beautiful nature that we hear. We're reminded, Father, that it is only you that created the created, Father. That you have made us into your handiwork, that we've come out of the dirt, Father. And Father, as we've journeyed in this life and as we start to awaken the reality of what is happening around of us, around us, Father, we want to be awakened, Father, in this Easter blessing to know that Jesus is above everything, that Jesus came and he died, that Jesus came and he was buried, and then three days later, Father, he rose again, and that is the blessing of Easter, the resurrection of your one and only son. We want that sense of awareness, Father, and we pray that those who do not know you in this space would come to know the name above all names, Jesus. And for those of us that have known you and have followed you for many days of our life, may we not forget, may we remember, and may we live out our life in action. And may that action be the agape love of Jesus. We love you, Father. Thank you for rising up, Father. Thank you, Father, for honoring Every aspect of what we do, we pray we can honor you above and beyond. We love you, Father, and all that agrees say this morning.
service where we take the Lord's Supper or communion. If you're visiting, you'll find in your seat these small containers holding a small piece of bread and a small sip of juice. You're invited to join us as your heart moves you. But why do we do this? Life is hard, sometimes very hard, and Jesus knew it was harder alone. So we do this to remember that we're a family, that we are in this hard ride together. So when we eat this bread and we drink this cup, be aware of those around you. Remember the unity of the church. Unfortunately, we as humans often choose the hard way. Since the Garden of Eden, we have always wanted things our way, often to our own detriment. But we need to come back under the rule of God. So this table is open to all, a reminder that we can have salvation and be united with God. But life can be beautiful also. Jesus, Jesus showed us what a beautiful life can look like. The hungry fed, the deaf hearing, the blind seeing, Jesus asked us to do this so that we remember him, to remind us of a redeemed world. And this is a reminder of what life can be like when we're united with him. The Jewish people needed reminders that this moment was coming. So in Isaiah 52, he wrote or said, Awake, awake, Zion. Close, clothe yourself with your strength. Dress in your splendid garments, Jerusalem, the holy city, for the uncircumcised and the unclean will enter you no more. Shake off the dust. Arise. Be enthroned, Jerusalem. Loosen the chains on your neck, captive daughter of Zion. For thus says the Lord, you were sold for nothing and you were redeemed without money. Therefore, my people will know my name. Therefore, on that day, they will know that I, the one speaking, here I am. Look at me. 
How beautiful on the mountain are the feet of him who bring the good news, proclaiming shalom, peace. Bringing the good news of good things, announcing salvation, and saying to Zion, your God is king. Listen, your watchmen are raising their voices, shouting for joy together, for they will see before their own eyes the Lord returning to Zion. Break out into joy, sing together, you ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm in the sight of every nation and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. See how my servant will succeed. He will be raised up, exalted, highly honored, just as many were appalled at him because he was so disfigured that he didn't even seem human and simply no longer looked like a man. So now he will startle many nations. Because of him, kings will be speechless. For they will see what they had not been told. They will ponder the things they had never heard. And I'm here to proclaim to you the good news that Isaiah was prophesying about. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose to life and conquered death. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for your risen Son. Thank you for the bread and the cup to remind us of all that life can be in Jesus. Help us to live a redeemed life, to be a reflection of heaven as we walk through this life together. Amen. This is the bread of heaven, the body of Christ your King. Eat it and remember. This is the blood of the new covenant, the lifeblood of your King. Drink it and remember. Good morning. The tomb is still empty. Can I get an amen? Amen. And uh, thank you for joining us for the celebration on Easter that the tomb is empty. You know, Friday, Jesus went to the cross for the forgiveness of all sins, and everybody thought it was over. But today, we're reminded that it's not over. It's just the beginning. And so if you're a guest with us, we are so glad that you are joining us, whether here in the auditorium or watching online. Uh, Thank you for joining us in our celebration. But we want you to know that we don't just celebrate this on Easter. Uh, We celebrate this every day that God has given us the breath of life. We wake up and know that this place is not our home, that our home is in heaven only because of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sins and what he has given to us. And today is just an extension of that celebration of what we live out every day or try to live out. And if you're a guest with us today, we want you to know one thing. We say this from the platform all the time, but we want to make sure that if you've heard it before, it really sinks in, or maybe if you haven't heard it before, that you hear it, that if you're looking for a place that is a perfect place where all the members have it all figured out, their life is in order, and everything is great, and rainbows and butterflies, Pleasant Valley is not it. Because we don't have it all together. We have a lot of sin. We all have sin. We have a lot of baggage. And so if you're a guest with us today and you're looking for a place uh, to call home, a church to call home, Pleasant Valley would love for you to call this place your home because you're going to be gathered with a family that is a family of sinners who has struggles, who has temptations, who don't get it right every day, who fail every day, but we come together and remind each other that Jesus Christ gave us his life on the cross, and that's why we're here here celebrating this morning, and that's why we celebrate every day. So if you're a guest with us, we're so glad that you're here, and we'd love for you in two weeks from today, join us in what we call our guest lunch, and you're probably like, oh, here we go. They're going to try to get me to sign all these papers, and no, we're not going to do any of that. We just want to feed you after second service. It's a come and go. We just want to have the opportunity to meet you and to get to know you. And if you have questions about Pleasant Valley, if you have questions about uh, baptism or any of those things, we'd love to share that with you. But plan on joining us April 14th for our guest luncheon. Uh, I'm a prodigal son. And if you look around this auditorium, there's a lot of prodigal sons and a lot of prodigal daughters who have ventured off. And I, I chase the things of the world. I thought, man, this is going to make me happy. This is going to fulfill the things I'm looking for until I was very successful and did all the things of the world and realized I'm still empty because Jesus Christ can only fill that emptiness. And so if you have questions today, once again, we'd love to study with you and uh, share the good news with you this morning. Uh, We're going to pray over our offering. We have an opportunity to give back this morning. Here's different ways to do that. pvcc.org slash give. 
our church center app. Uh, you can mail that in, or we have boxes in the back. But let's, uh, let's go to God in prayer this morning as we get back with a cheerful heart. God, we are so thankful for such a beautiful day. God, we're thankful that the tomb is still empty. God, we're thankful that your son came to this earth. He showed us and taught us the way. God, he went to the cross willingly. Even though he was scared, he took those nails. He wore that crown of thorns. God, he took all the laughter and the mocking. He carried his own cross to Golgotha. And God, he died on it for the forgiveness of all sins. But God, three days later, that tomb was empty. Everybody thought it was over, but it was just beginning. God, may we see the truth in this life. May we not get pulled away by the lies of Satan. May we not get pulled into the temptations and the struggles of this world. God, that emptiness that a lot of us have had can only be filled by you. God, may we be bold in sharing the good news, not just with our words, but with our actions. Because, God, we know we are not of this world. This world that we're living right now, we're just passing through. Our home is in heaven with you. God, thank you for the celebration. Because one day we too will rise and be able to go home. We thank you for our guests this morning. We ask that you watch over them and bless them. Give them strength. God, thank you that we have a place like Pleasant Valley where all of us sinners can come together. And we can be encouraged. We can hold each other accountable. And we can be reminded of the truth of why we exist today. May we give back with a cheerful heart. God, may we give back what we can and these funds go into this world to continue to spread the good news of, of your son, Jesus Christ. God, may you get all the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, this morning, uh, kids, I tell you what, we're going to kind of do this a little bit different. Kids, if you want to go ahead, where are my, my Chun kids, the Chun kids? Awesome Chun kids here. Ready, always ready. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, kids, if you want to go ahead and start making your way up here right now to give your offering. So kids, go ahead and start coming. Um, there is no kids' church today, so parents, so if your kid runs out of here, you better take off. Um, but kids, kids, you're going to come up here and give your offering and then join the worship team on the stage. So put your money in there and then come up on the platform. Uh, let's see if they do that. So come up on the platform. Yeah, come up here. They're going to sing with you. Yeah, come on up here. There, Yeah, there you go. Uh, if you're a guest with us, this is what we do. Our kids come and give their offering. And then normally we have what we call kids' church where they can you know, go and have a, a lesson for them, but we're not having that today or classes, but the kids will give their offering this morning and come and, and, uh, and join the worship team on the stage for a song. So kids, uh, come on up and let's join the Our worship kids, team. Let's sing, Lord, I lift your name on high together. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. So glad you came to save us. Here we go. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to see you. Thank you. 
He was God. When you say it's anti-scientific, I don't think it's anti-scientific at all. Science cannot say that miracles do not occur. It can say they're highly improbable. But nobody is claiming that these things occurred by natural processes. They, they occurred because God fed his power in. Nor did the whole universe. Uh, if we look at it, occur in that sense by natural processes. God created, we study all the natural processes within it. So when you say it's anti-scientific, I think it's not anti-scientific. What I mean by that is that if and when doing science, we constantly have to keep in mind that at any moment, there might be a little magic trick slipped in that would completely nullify the whole enterprise of science. Oh, I agree with that. But well, you that, see, but that's but what this you're is, allowing them. No, no, I'm not allowing that at all, because in order to recognize what the New Testament calls miracle, a special act of God, you must be living in a universe that has regularities and that we recognize them. I agree with you entirely. Otherwise, that's you wouldn't why, notice the miracles. But, that's yeah. exactly true. Yeah. You wouldn't recognize if dead people were popping up all over the place. You wouldn't think it was very special. But the fact is you need two things, not one. You've got to have regu reg regularities, which we call the laws of nature, although they're not causes. They're, in a sense, descriptions that we can use. You also need to be able to recognize those so that, for example, when um, Joseph discovered that his uh, wife-to-be, Mary, was pregnant, he simply didn't believe her story. He was going to divorce her. He knew exactly where babies came from. He knew the regularity. It took very special convincing for him to realize that something extremely special had happened. But science cannot stop that. The question is, of course, did such a thing ever happen? And the central focus in the New Testament is not that, which is not so readily accessible to evidence, the virgin conception, but the resurrection of Christ. And ancient historians, and this has fascinated me recently going over it, ancient historians whose discipline is very venerable, and I'm not talking about Christian ancient historians, ancient historians, many of them, even at the skeptical end of the spectrum, say that the evidence for the resurrection of Christ is very powerful. The explosion of the Christian church from a non-proselytizing group of Jews in the first century, the empty tomb and all the rest of it, has even led Geza Vermesh, who's one of the most distinguished ancient historians in Oxford, to, to say, yes, this tomb was empty, and hallucinations and this kind of explanation do not wash. So, we have to ask ourselves, are we prepared to believe in historical testimony or not? So that was the atheist Richard Dawkins and a Christian, both scientists, a Christian named John Lennox, debating the evidence of Jesus' resurrection. Their whole debate is on YouTube. It happened a few years ago in London. I, I recommend it. It's a great thing because happy Easter, everyone. So this is not, for followers of Jesus, a private feeling that we have. This is a truth that either happened or did not happen. And what it means is it doesn't matter what you've done. Christians today, right now, all across the globe are gathered, some in buildings like this, some in cathedrals, some in strip malls, some under mango trees, and we're all celebrating this amazing claim to truth that Jesus is risen. And, and by the way, if you're on the outside of the Christian faith, welcome, so glad that you're here. I realize this sounds bizarre, uh, but I want you to know there are, there are doctors here, there are lawyers, there are scientists and engineers who actually believe this. And they're not a group of people, pro we're not a group of people prone to believing just you know strange things. But there is this remarkable claim that is at the center of our life that there was a man who was thoroughly killed. And three days later, he stopped being dead, and he's still not dead. 2,000 years ago, he stopped being dead, 
And he's not dead ever. He's never died again. Do you, I, want, I want you to know what this means. It means for everyone, everyone's welcome. Anything's possible and nobody's perfect except for one guy. We gather, and Christians around the world and throughout history for the last 2,000 years have gathered at every Sunday. People in the ancient world, they didn't gather on Sunday. No group of religious people gathered specifically on Sunday, but Christians have. And we did it because God rose Jesus from the dead. And we celebrate that what he did for Jesus, he's going to do for every single one of us. So no matter what you do or do not believe... Whatever you've done or haven't done, whatever your life looks like, Resurrection Sunday means that. And it can mean that for you too. And if you're a guest, maybe you're here today because somebody promised you a lunch afterwards, but you think this is really far-fetched. Um, and you're looking around and you're like, I can't believe these people believe this. Like, you know, it's on the outside, I could see it being like, you know, believing in zombies or a group of people gather together to talk, whisper about Elvis still being alive or whatever. Or maybe, maybe you grew up in the South and it's kind of a cultural thing that we do, especially on Easter, like this. Have y'all seen this shirt? My teenage boy wants this shirt so bad. But I'm glad that you're here. And I hope to show you today, this is more than just a story. It's good and beautiful and true. So let's start there. Is it actually true? Christianity is unique in world religions in that we actually are pretty vulnerable to history. That is, we we say certain things happen in history. And if they didn't, then this whole thing is, is hogwash. So that is to say, the Christian faith is not about some otherworldly ideas, or that if you just believe in it, like a Tinkerbell kind of thing, you know, or a poetic idea. Christianity doesn't rise or fall with the Bible. It doesn't rise or fall with how you vote. Christianity rises and falls on whether this really happened. One of the earliest things that an early church planner, one of the earliest Christian writings we have is from a guy named Paul, and he actually says it like this in 1 Corinthians. If Jesus has not been raised, your faith is futile. And by the way, you're still in your sins. Um, Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 15, just 20 years after the resurrection he's written, And he is saying, Jesus appeared, and he appeared to 500 people who he says are mostly still alive. Sometimes people ask, when Jesus was raised from the dead, why didn't he appear to unbelievers? So I want to show you, he actually did. In that same passage, just a few verses earlier, Paul wrote, after he was raised, he appeared to more than 500 of his brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to, read that name with me, James. Then to all the apostles. Now, who is James? James was famously Jesus' brother. And James did not believe in him. In fact, the Gospels, three of the Gospels actually tell us this. Uh, Gospels are the biographies of Jesus. Look at what it says in uh, John chapter seven. For even his own brothers did not believe him. And so I've asked our seven-year-old Judah, if you could come on up here. He does not know what I'm doing. I just told him you're going to be answering a question. Um, So I haven't prepped him for this. I have no idea how this is going to go. Good morning, Judah. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. So here's the question. Judah, You have a nine-year-old brother named Joel. What would you think if I told you that Joel was God? It wouldn't be so good. (laughs) (laughs) Do you think... (laughs) Do you think it's possible that he's God? I mean, maybe that's why he's good at basketball? No. No, not at all? (laughs) I mean, you share a room with him. Have you ever seen him do any kind of godlike things? He cleans the room, but he sometimes overreacts a bunch. <laughs> okay. 
So the chances of Joel actually being God are? Not at all. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay, can we thank Judah for being here? <laughs> Okay, how many brothers are in the audience? All right. Now, I, I know this is kind of a, a silly way of doing it, but I want you to think about this. James, Jesus' brother, grew up with him. And the Gospels don't try to hide it. I would. If you're starting a religion, you would hide it. But James does not believe that Jesus is from God. He's like, oh, man, he's a pretty great brother until he starts going like that. And here's what, I, you know, if you're, if you're skeptical, I totally get it, um, but I want you to see a couple of things. You may think, okay, if he, of course, he's kind of self, he, he, he would get a lot if he started saying, yeah, my, bro, my brother's God or whatever, but he didn't. What he got was not glory. What he got was ostracization, plummeting social status, persecution, and in his case, James' case, execution just a few years after Jesus was raised from the dead. If you're wondering about that, you can look not just in the Bible, but in Josephus, a Jewish, not, he doesn't believe in Jesus. He's a historian from the first century. And he tells about James getting uh, stoned immediately afterwards. Here's what I want you to see. Jesus did appear to non-believers. They just stopped being non-believers after they saw a guy who was dead and stopped being dead. In other words, there are a lot of really good historical reasons to believe this is true. That's just one of them. There are a lot of really good reasons to believe it's true. And here's what I want to do today. I want to show you how it's not just historically true, how it's good news, not just for, you know, not just generally, but for you. Since I was eight years old, my parents growing up just always took me to funerals. When I was eight years old, I went to my first one. When I was 13, I did my first one. I, I've seen a lot being a pastor. I've seen a lot of stuff happen at funerals. I've seen families get into shouting marches or shouting matches in the parking lot. I've, I've seen, you know, them hugging at the cemetery afterwards. I've seen circus music played at the pass by. I've seen Tupac played, George Strait played. I've seen interpretive dance. I've seen the opposite of interpretive dance. <laughs> but I have never seen what happened in today's story. So if you have your Bibles, turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 11. The Gospel is the story. It's a biography of Jesus. And right in the middle of it is this story in chapter 11. A man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who per poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. It is for God's glory that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha. And her sister and Lazarus. So he heard that Lazarus was sick and he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you. And yet you were going back. And Jesus answered in this kind of cryptic way. Are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in daytime will not stumble for they, they will see by the world's life. It is a person who walks at night that stumbles for they have no light. After he said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad he, I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, who's also known as Didymus, that's his rapper name, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that, me, that we may die with him. So Jesus is getting told that this person that he cares a lot about, Lazarus, is sick, really sick. And yet he waits for a little bit. And the disciples, when they hear talking about going back, hey, you know there's a death warrant out for you. People are actively trying to kill you. And then he says, look, we've got to go back because this sickness will not end in death. And then he ends by saying, he's dead. You can see how confusing this is for the disciples, right? So 
what happens is, G, what you see in the story is this is not some abstract problem for Jesus. He actually loves this person. He's going to do something about it, but not yet. He stays away on purpose, and he says it's for our sake that he's doing that. And, and when the disciples find out that he's sick and sleeping, they, they're like, look, that's, uh, we're, not, you know, we're not you, Jesus, but that seems to be a pretty good thing for people who are sick to sleep. And Jesus lets them know, no, he's actually dead. And we're going to go now anyway. And they think, the disciples think, that they're going to go to their certain death. But they're going to follow him anyway. And that's when this happens in verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I, even now, I know God will give you whatever you ask. So Martha doesn't waste any words. She goes straight to Jesus, and she's like, look, you could have done something about this. But then she seems to think, you still can do something about this. Now, here's the thing. If you grew up in church or you've heard this story before, it's easy to jump to the end. But Martha's problem is our problem. Because we all know people we have loved and lost. We're, for thousands, for, you know, forever, the human being has been plagued by death and what happens to the people we love, to us, when we die. And, and Martha thinks Jesus can do something about this, but she doesn't think Jesus can raise somebody from the dead. That's not the way the world works. And then in verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha says, I know he'll rise again at the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection. Okay, here's the thing about what Jewish people believed for thousands of years. They believed that there was a resurrection coming. And let me just explain what that means to you because I think in the kind of American version of Christianity, we've lost the plot. It is not about your soul going to some abstract heaven. It's about God raising your body. Your body, your actual body is going to be resurrected and transformed. That's what the Jews believed. That's what Jesus believed. A resurrection. Your body is going to be, what God did for Jesus, he's going to do for every part of creation. And the Jews knew that was going to happen, but they believed that was going to happen at the end of days when uh, human history is over. God is going to raise all the dead, uh, some, some to judgment and some to glory. That was what Mary, Martha's talking about. And Jesus responds by saying, it's not just at the last day. Mary, Martha, you are looking at the resurrection right now. She says, I am the resurrection and the life. And the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe in this? And she says, yes, Lord. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Do you notice Martha didn't answer Jesus' question? I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me. You know, he, he asks this question and Martha says, I believe in you. And that was enough. So they go and they get her sister Mary. Jesus starts headed to the tomb where Lazarus is. All the Jewish people who were friends and family of this family, they start coming to check out uh, what's happening. They go to the tomb of, of Lazarus. And Jesus sees Martha and Mary weeping, and this is what happens in verse 33. When Jesus saw them weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have they laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. And the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not the man who, who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? 
Here's what I want you to see. Within just a couple of verses, Jesus tells Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Within a couple of verses of that, Jesus is weeping. Why? So you may know how the story ends. In just a couple of minutes, Jesus is going to not resurrect Lazarus, because Lazarus is going to die again. He resuscitates him. He breathes life back into this guy who's been dead for four days. But that's the end of the story, and we haven't got there yet. Stuck between the story of Jesus finding out Lazarus is sick and Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead is the story of this one that we say, he says, is the resurrection, weeping. And I like that for you, for me, for us. Because we live in between those stories, don't we? I know a lot of hospital rooms don't end in happy endings. I live in a world where every funeral ends with a burial, not a miracle. And it's here we find out Jesus is with us then too. I think Jesus weeps because this is the answer to the question you've asked hundreds of times in your life. Do you even care, God? Christianity is not like every other world religion. That's a modern kind of secular narrative. It's not just some human story we made up to feel good about ourselves. I mean, what kind of people would make up a story like this about a God who was publicly shamed on a cross, stripped naked and, and publicly shamed? Jesus is trying to, he's telling us this is what God is like. And he's showing us at the heart of the universe is not some indifferent power. It's not some monster who enjoys tricking us. At the heart of the universe is love. And love cares about those who are suffering. I, I don't know why God made things the way they are. I don't know why there's cancer. I don't know why there's divorce. I don't, I don't know why there's so much pain and suffering. I don't know why God gave human beings freedom even though he knew what we were going to do with it. And some days I feel this question. Jesus, do you care? But I believe Jesus is love in the flesh and the way things are are not the way things are always going to be. And here's something we miss in this story because English translations don't actually translate this one word. When it says Jesus... Uh, is deeply moved, it's a word that means he snorted with anger. Somehow Bible translators, they don't, they don't do that. They don't translate that. But he's, in, he's raging. What's he angry at? He's not angry at the disciples. He's not angry at the family. He's not angry at the crowd. He is looking at the greatest nightmare human beings has ever faced. And he's angry at death. In the language of the New Testament, death is the last enemy to be defeated. Dylan Thomas was right. Do not go gentle into that good, na good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Jesus is raging against death. He's not saying, look, everybody just get used to it. Everybody dies. It's just the way things are. In this moment, Jesus is, fa is facing the very power he came to destroy. And Jesus wants you to know... He wins this fight. Here's how the Gospel of John says it. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the, to the tomb, and it was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been dead for four days. In the King James Version, it said, But Lord, he stinketh. <laughs> then Jesus said... Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked up and said, <coughs> Father, I thank you. You have heard me. I, knew, I know you always hear me, but I'm doing this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. John has been telling us for several chapters now, in him all things were made. The voice of God who speaks and sons appear. The voice of God who speaks and trees show up just says to the dead, come out. And he specifies Lazarus so everybody won't come out. But 
when he says it, Lazarus had no choice but to come out. And the dead man came out. His hands and feet are wrapped with strips of linen, a cloth around his face. And Jesus says to him, and listen to it. Listen, you can hear Moses. Let my people go. This is the new exodus. The greatest fear we have ever had is death. And Jesus is our Moses delivering the way through. Jesus is a funeral wrecker. He's a grave robber. He pays no attention to the manners of the burial or you know the, the funeral that's happening. Martha, very practical, you know, points out, hey, there's going to be some bad. It, she's pointing out the effects of death. Because it's not just that you lose that person. Death keeps robbing you all along the way, before death and after. And I think this is what Jesus is promising us all. This is why Easter is such a big deal. Because it's not just that God raised Jesus from the dead. He raised Jesus from the dead as a first fruit, pointing to what God is going to do for every one of us. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He faces our greatest enemy, gets in a cage match with death, and walks away three days later being like, you should see the other guy. Ty Cobb, who is one of the best baseball players in history, towards the end of his life, he, when he was in his 70s, a news reporter asked him, what do you think you would, uh, you know, he was like, a, he, he batted like 350. That was his batting average when he was playing. And a news reporter asked him, what do you think you would bat if you were playing today? And Ty Cobb thought about it for a second and he said, I'll probably around 300. And the news reporter said, is that because of all the new pitches, like the slider or because of night games, artificial turf, you know? And Ty Cobb said, no, it's because I'm over 70 years old. <laughs> the second law of thermodynamics, you may not know it, but you know it, is that everything slowly decays. Everything in the universe moves to disorder and decay. Cars rust, foods rot, and of course our human bodies keep getting older. It takes a lot of forms but it's the law of entropy. And death is not just the end of life. It's the robbing of the life that happens on the way. Losing a step. Losing memories. Relationships. Jesus in this story is addressing all that and more. One of the things in the biography of Jesus and John. He keeps doing these things and calling them signs. And a sign is something that points to something beyond itself. And a couple of observations I want you to see here. Jesus intentionally does not go to Lazarus when he's still alive. He waits. And he says he waits for you. He wants us to know what he's going to do. He says, for your sake, I'm glad we're not there yet. This is something Jesus is doing to show us what God is like. You know, Lazarus is going to die again. Why does Jesus even do this? Lazarus wasn't resurrected into eternal glory. He was resuscitated for a few, maybe a couple more decades. And while we're at it, why do we care about addressing suffering? Or grief. Or why do we care about, you know, like, why do Christians care about trying to help people who are in poverty? It seems like it just keeps coming wave after wave. Is there any point in addressing a broken marriage? Or a friendship that's broken? When it would just be easier to cut it all off and move on? This is one of the things that's unique about the Christian faith and the panoply of world religions. Here's the way C.S. Lewis, a Christian 60 years ago, said this. Confronted with a cancer or a slum, a pantheist who says, you know, basically nature is God. The pantheist can say, if you can only see it from the divine point of view, you would realize that this is also God. And the Christian replied, don't talk dumb nonsense, for Christianity is a fighting religion. If it thinks God made the world, but it also thinks a great many things are wrong with the world th that God made. And that God insists and insists very loudly on putting them right again. 
Jesus is in a fight, and he will win. He is the grave robber. Jesus is giving us a preview of coming attractions. In other words, Jesus does this because Lazarus' resurrection, this does not just foreshadow Jesus' resurrection. It foreshadows your resurrection. He knows Lazarus is going to die again, but what he's, seeing, what he's showing us is a sign pointing to what is going to happen to every one of us. Lazarus is going to die again, but Lazarus will not die the same way again. And he will not live the same way either. So when I was in high school, in, uh, growing up in, in central Arkansas, there used to be Just for Feet stores all over. There were shoe stores. But you remember those, Just for Feet? Okay, yeah. And they had like a basketball gym in them. And you could go in and play, like play pickup games. So I did. I was like 18, 17, 18 years old. I was a senior in homeschool high school, and I was the starting point guard <laughs> for the Saline County Homeschool Warriors. It was kind of a big deal. And anyway, so at least I thought I was a big deal. So I go to Just for Feet, and I'm, you know, shoe shopping, shoe looking, and there's this kid who's younger and smaller than me. I'm like 17, 18. He's like 13 or 14. Um, and he wants to play pickup because uh, I was just shooting around. He wants to play a pickup game, and I'm like, yeah, I guess so. I guess God has ordained this moment for me to teach this kid some humility. <laughs> so we start playing, and I realize... Um, God's on his side, actually, because he's so, so good. I found out later he was like, he played for Central High. He was like a starter for Central High. He was not as impressed with my homeschool basketball resume as I was, and he was just phenomenal at basketball, and the worst part about playing this guy is he just talked so much trash, like over and over again. He'd be like... <clears throat> Uh, he, he actually said something like, Onathan, they should call you Onathan because you ain't got no J. That was one. And at one point, I get past him, and I go up for a layup thinking I, he let me go past him, and then he blocks me just so hard. He's like four years younger than me. He blocks me as he lands. He looks at me, and he says, the worst trash-talking line somebody can say. He says, is that all you've got? To which I was like, yeah, no, that's it. That's all I've got. <laughs> and the reason that's the worst trash talking line you can say is because if you give the best you've got, if you've poured your best out, and at the end of it, your opponent is still standing, it is safe to assume you lost. Mm -hmm. That early church planner, Paul, 20 years after the resurrection, as he's reminding these churches he planted, like, look, there's, there's a lot of people you can go and ask about this. This really happened. This is a historical event that happened that changed everything. At the end of that very letter, just a few verses later, he teaches these early Christians who are going to die some of the most horrible ways imaginable. He teaches them how to go through this and talk trash to death. Here's what Paul actually says. When the perishable, your body, when the perishable is clothed with the imperishable and the mortal morta with the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. And by the way, I want you to see, in order for something to swallow something else, it has to be bigger than that thing. Victory is bigger than death and has swallowed it up. So Paul says, here's how you approach death. He says, talk about it like this. Where, oh, death is your victory. Where, oh, death is your sting. He's teaching us to talk trash to death. Death, is that the best you can do? I love how honest the Christian faith is. Right before Jesus dies, he gathers up his disciples and he says, the most empirically verifiable thing Jesus ever says, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, he has overcome the world. One year ago to the day, an F3 tornado tore through this city. One year ago to the day, this happened. We don't need a lot of convincing that in this world we will have trouble. Life is hard. To quote the great theological movie, The Princess Bride, life is pain, princess, 
And anyone who tries to tell you differently is selling something. But Jesus says, push through, take heart, have courage. I have overcome the world. If you are tired of life, you are ready for Jesus. I cannot tell you, as a pastor, I have hundreds of times sat with people who are facing death. For them, death is not some abstract reality. It's coming in the next few days. And I have seen a distinct difference between people who have given their lives, who have been forgiven and followed Jesus, and the way they, the way they face the end of their mortal body, and the people who haven't. I am telling you, this is coming for all of us. You don't have to do this alone. And the same God who has raised Jesus from the dead can walk you through this next to the next life as well. I have done prison ministry for years in Fort Worth and I have seen men who have been in who have been sentenced to prison for the rest of their life. They're going to spend the rest of their life behind bars, but because of the resurrection of Jesus, they are free. I want to say to the elderly person, and your health is gone, your, your body is frail, you don't have to live in fear. You have a resurrection coming. To the devastated husband whose wife has left you, to the wife whose husband has left you, you feel betrayed and alone. You don't have to live lonely. There is a future world coming. You have a resurrection coming. To the frightened parents of a child who's struggling, you are not in, you don't have to live burdened by the weight of blame. You have a resurrection coming. To an anxious worker who's worried about losing their job or, or worried about uh, they, uh, finding a new one, you have a resurrection coming. To a guilt ridden addict hiding in the shadows, you don't have to live that way. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to you. You have a resurrection coming to the lonely young person longing to be loved. You don't have to live alone. You have a resurrection coming of God's people that are right here, right now, embodying that. To all the Easter people clinging to this resurrection story, Jesus is risen. The world has changed courses. We can change courses. You can change courses. Praise be to God. Let's stand and worship. And there will be a day with old bow before Him. And there will be a day when death will be no more. The standing face to face with He who died and rose again.
I'd like to invite our um, prayer teams to take a step out into the aisle right here. You can see them stepping out. If you would like the prayers of some godly people or you'd like to know more about this church or following Jesus or how to put your faith and hope in this person who was resurrected, right after this benediction, they're going to be out. They're going to be here and they'd love to pray or talk with you about anything you got going on in your life. I want to tell you, quick announcement, there are donuts out there. So, yeah, uh, you're probably going to want to beat the kids because last time I saw like four donuts on this kid's hand. His last name was Stormont. Anyway, it's uh, just get out there as soon as possible. Um, And the second thing, next week we are starting a series, a sermon series on the Bible, what it is, uh, how to read it. Um, It's called text messages. Um, A lot of times when people doubt the Christian faith, it's because they hear some silly stuff about the Bible. Um, And I I just want to help us know what it is. Like, even if you don't believe, your world has been shaped by the Bible. And I'd like to explain to you why it is the words of God and how you can read it and appreciate it today. All right, my brothers and sisters, until next week of benediction. May you come to have hope in the resurrected Lord. And may the same power that raised God from the dead be with us this week. Go in peace. Hallelujah and praise the Lord who set me free. A hallelujah. Well, death has lost its grip on me. We do have a broken in every chain. And there's salvation in your name. For Jesus Christ, my people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We'll praise the Lord. Thank you.